So we just handle it by looking at the evidence and the overwhelming supportive evidence of archaeology, historical accounts, paleontology, and the Bible account shows that dinosaurs and man live together. And if you believe that, that dinosaurs were millions of years before man came along and everything evolved to that, then we too are evolving and then there's no personal sin. Adam was not the first sinner. There was no Adam. We're not responsible for our sins. Jesus Christ himself was mistaken. He could not have been God because he was wrong about the Bible and the Old Testament and even probably mistaken about his mission. He was deluded. These are all the kind of problems you come with when you start saying that uh, dinosaurs uh, are millions of years ago. And then what we have is it's just whoever, whoever has their opinion of what's right and wrong. There are no rights, there are no wrongs. And eventually there is no church and there's no reason to go out and evangelize people. Why evangelize if you have a book that's just along every other book and Jesus Christ was not who he said he was and he didn't die for our sins and he's evolving too. He had to be evolving too. And if we're evolving, then we're not responsible for anything. That's what Jane Fonda said. She said, well, you know, people used to only live to be 50, 60 years old, and so they could stay with one husband. That was her reason for divorcing her first husband. Then she married Ted Turner, who says the Ten Commandments are obsolete. No, Ted. The Ten Commandments are not obsolete. They're absolutes. There are very few absolutes, but the absolutes are absolutely absolute. And so what we have is a God who always speaks the truth and is absolutely right about everything, and we can trust the scriptures. And that gives pastors the confidence to go out and proclaim the gospel and win people to Jesus Christ. I've had many people thank me for the conferences we have uh, on creationism you know, out in Oregon because the pastors come and they say, you know what, now I can go back and preach the book of Genesis and believe it and know it to be true from God's word. So we need this movement of scientific creationism and the emphasis is on scientific because it is science in the hands of people to show that the Bible is reliable and it's God's word to us for today. If it's in National Geographic and Reader's Digest, it's got to be true. Even though National Geographic has been proved wrong over and over again. And the Bible is always right. The Bible is the only book that's been shown over and over again that what we read in God's Word, we see in God's world. That the critics and the skeptics about the Hittites and uh, the Mesopotamian uh, uh, culture of Nebuchadnezzar, every single thing that the so far, the liberals and the critics have said against the Bible was later proved uh, correct by archaeological research and other documentation. So the Bible was right after all. Dinosaurs and men lived together. And Richard Dawkins himself admitted, if dinosaurs and men live together, evolution is destroyed. It is blown out of the water. It's kaput. Finish. It's a, a zero with the rims kicked off. It's through. But Carl Sagan in The Dragons of Eden, because the dragon depictions are so accurate and they're so numerous in all the cultures around the world, he said that what happened during 65 million years ago is some mammals saw a dinosaur. And these mammals were so terrified, they were so frightened that it became embedded in their subconscious. And it was passed up the evolutionary ladder for 65 million years. And then it emerged as an evolutionary hiccup in the brain of some bushman up in, in, out in Zimbabwe. And he drew a Diplodocus dinosaur on the cave wall. You know, who says scientists don't believe in miracles? Miracles. In miracles. Well, the ministry I have at the Dinosaur Institute, uh, I do a lot of archaeological work. Archaeology is a career that leads one to ruins. You want to be married to an archaeologist because the older you get, the more you know he loves you. But how we handle the dinosaur dilemma, it's not a dilemma. 
because we have at least 72 petroglyph sites around the world. Those are rock art carvings done by the Anastasi in the American Southwest. We have a Diplodocus dinosaur done between 750 AD and 1200 AD of a dinosaur. It's right there in stone. There's no question about it. It is authentic, it's real. There's a Triceratops in southwestern Colorado done by the Abajo Lasa Anastasi Indians. The Hanada Mugiwan Indians who lived from 1000 to 1400 AD, uh, they depicted a Parasophilus dinosaur in their rock art in, in New Mexico. Uh, we have more than 72 sites around the world. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is just above Afghanistan, next to Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, near Stan the Man and Chipistan. The last two are not countries. But they are there. There's dinosaur footprints and human footprints on the Turkmenistan Plateau. I have seen those and the evidence of the dinosaurs walking with man in a supposed alleged Jurassic lair 220 million years ago. So we have dinosaur and human footprints together. We have petroglyphs. We also have a number of ceramic vases done by the Mochi who inhabited northern Peru from 60 AD to 800 AD. And during that time, they drew uh, and fired it on their pottery, the stirrup vessels, pots, uh, and these were dug up in official archaeological excavations in Peru and we see dinosaurs with dermal spines, uh, the frills like an iguana. Uh, if you look at the paleontological and textbooks about dinosaurs before the late 1990s, they show the dinosaurs with a smooth skin and no frills on the back. But in 1992, Stephen Zirkus in geology uh, showed that through the fossilized specimens that dinosaurs had frills on the back like an iguana. And the ancient Mochi people had to have seen the living dinosaurs because they depicted them anatomically correct on their vases. And then we journeyed in uh, January of 2006 deep in the uh, jungles of Cambodia uh, where a temple had been swallowed up and engulfed by the jungle and there on a temple wall that was dedicated in 1186 AD is a Stegosaurus dinosaur. One of the skeptics looked at it and said it had to be a dog with its hair bristling and angry. But you just look at it, the picture of it uh, that's uh, in the books and I have it in my book, The Secret of the Eka Stones and the Nazca Lines, proofs that dinosaurs and man lived together. They had to have seen a living dinosaur once again to try it accurately. Then of course we have the Eka Stones. Uh, where it shows a collection of stones uh, dug up in tombs in southern Peru. And the critics say, well, no, those are recent uh, carvings. The first mention of the Ica stones is 1535. Father Simeon traveling of Pizarro, uh, the conquistador in the southern region of the Ica low lying plains, mentions the strange engraved stones done by the Indians down there. There were the Wari, the Ica, the Tiwanaka the Noscans and the Paracas people who carved stones uh, and buried them in the tombs. And there's about 300 to 400 of them approximately that have been found that have dinosaurs on them. The Spaniards sent them back to Spain in 1562. In 1571, the chronicler to the Incas, Juan de Cruz Paracute Yonca, uh, in two paragraphs, he talks about the engraved stones and also the dragones on the stone. Uh, there is a, these are very rare books. There's only two copies of his uh, uh, Chronically of the Incas that survived. And one of them is in a museum in uh, Peru. And I've looked at this. So what I'm saying, well, how do we handle this? We handle it scientifically from the archaeological evidence, the historical evidence, and the uh, paleontological evidence that dinosaurs and man live together. Um, for instance, the finding of unfossilized dinosaur bones in Prudhoe Bay in Alaska. Uh, nothing survived for 65 million years if it's just soft and it's unfossilized bones. Or Mary Switzer in 1995, well, looking through a microscope at T-Rex bone. Uh, and she looked at it and said, whoa, man, I got goosebumps. She found tiny red blood cells. Uh, red blood cells do not survive for 65 million years they would be hard put to survive for a few thousand years. I've had forensic laboratories analyze some stuff that's 1500 years old 
and they couldn't even find red blood cells in the human blood. Uh, so how does something 65 million years uh, pass by and it not disappear? That's an impossibility. We need to equip pastors and churches to give an adequate and ready answer for these kind of questions. You know, I went to a liberal school where there were theologians who believed the Bible was inspired in spots, and they were inspired to spot the spots that were inspired, and others were inspired to spot the spots that they didn't spot. A kind of a Dalmatian book, like a Dalmatian dog, you got spots of inspiration. Well, it's all equally inspired, it's just not all equally interesting. So I was not equipped when I went through seminary and colleges. I went to nine different universities and colleges. I studied for three PhDs. I had more degrees than the thermometer. But people did not equip me about looking at the evidence for dinosaurs and man living together. And that's why we need strong, vital creationism ministries when these questions arise. It's just not that pastors don't want to answer. They just don't have tools in their hands. They need DVDs. They need books. They need to hear the other side. Well, I believe that we're living in perilous times. The undercurrents against the Church of Jesus Christ and the relativism. I believe we need to early on get material into children's hands that dinosaurs and man live together and God's Word can be trusted. Uh, we had one meeting with almost 10,000 children, little children. I do not believe in brainwashing, but I do believe in thought molding. And we have to give them the proper thoughts and the proper teaching. And I think if we early on will give the information to the children, talking to them about dinosaurs in a language that they can understand, in, in, and with pictures and, and books and videos and DVDs, because then they can go and say, you know what? God created me. God created the dinosaurs. God created everything. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I would say to you, find somebody it's worth an investment. Uh, creation Evangelism Ministry, there's many. Uh, ICR, Institute of Creation Research. Uh, Answers in Genesis. Uh, Carl Baugh's Ministry, the Creation Evidence Museum. Get some books, some DVDs. You know, uh, uh, materials. A $10 investment. I've literally had from the conference that we have in Portland, Oregon, that it's gone around the world. And sometimes people will just give an audio tape to somebody and they hear it and they go, wow, I never heard this before. Why didn't somebody tell me? I was uh, in my mid thirties as a pastor of a large church in Beaverton, Oregon. And I'm gonna tell you, I had a creationist come and speak at the church reluctantly because I believed in theistic evolution. But I'm telling you, when he spoke, and I heard it for the first time, I said, where has the world been? Why didn't somebody tell me this? I never knew this kind of material existed. I never heard about the age of the earth, the supporting evidence. I never heard of uh, the implications of what it means to the Bible. I never heard that Genesis was really true because I'd gone to liberal institutions with liberal professors in a so-called evangelistic denomination that believed the Bible, but they didn't. They really didn't. And if we don't get in the ball game and do something, we're going to lose the war for people's souls. And I say, every soul is so precious. Whatever you can invest, whatever you do, and study yourself to be prepared. I believe this. We'll all be known by the problems we created or the problems we solved. And you have been created to solve a problem. Part of my mission in life was to work with the evidence of dinosaurs and man living together. But you have a mission. You have something. And if you'll just get the material in people's hands and teach them about dinosaurs and man living together, you know, we need to plunder hell in order to populate heaven. And for what you do, there, heaven ought to be a little bit fuller and hell a little bit emptier because of you getting this into the people's hands. And I thank you for what you're going to do for the cause of Christ. For he saved us not to be spectators, but to be gladiators. Don't sit, soak, sour, and stink, and sink in the pew and stew with the other few. Get out there and do something. 
Be a spirited spark at Spartacus in the arena of faith. Be a champion for Christ and get the word out to the people. And there'll be many who'll be in heaven who'll say, thank you for giving me this.